What's up, everybody? I'm here with uh, our good friend, Ben Greenfield. Hello. He is the biohacker extraordinaire and the host of the Ben Greenfield podcast. Uh, great podcast, almost as good as Mind Pump. So, so, got some questions for you. Why are you shouting? I don't know. Uh, I'm really so loud. loud. I'm, I'm <laughs> loud noises. I'm terrified. Um, so, the, I got some questions for you because uh, we get a lot of questions on some of the advanced cutting edge biohacking stuff that's out there. And mm. that's not really my wheelhouse. And so I'm happy that you're yeah. here because I get to ask not. you. You don't have any probes stuck to you right now. I'm not putting things up my butt and my nose and I'm not injecting uh, weird things. Just Speaking of it. which, I'm getting a lot of questions on peptides, injectable mm. peptides. I don't know what they are, but yes. I do see a lot of people getting them. And so what are they? Let's start with that. Not just injectable, also also oral. A lot, really? a lot of the studies that they've done in rodent models are oral because one of the most common peptides, or the, or the more commonly known peptides, is called BPC-157. And BPC actually stands for body protecting or body protection, I don't remember which, uh, compound. Okay. So that is something that you find in the gastric mucosa. In gastric juice. So it's a, is it a natural peptide that you would normally find then? It's not? Yes, they originally okay. gave it to rodent models to heal IBS and colitis and inflammatory gut issues because Whoa. that's where it's found. And further research showed that it induces angiogenesis when you inject it into, into tissue, like a joint. But, you, but I mean, orally drinking water, rodent models, it's actually, it has a great systemic effect. So what is but, angiogenesis, just so, for the audience? So ultimately, BPC-157, is it's a string of amino acids, which is what a, what a peptide actually is. And uh, the idea behind it is you would take this peptide and you would inject it into a joint. Typically, uh, you, and you could inject it yourself subcutaneously where you pinch the skin away and you would just use an insulin syringe, right? So, so you would order this stuff. It comes to your house as a powder. You would then take what's called bacteriostatic water which is a, a sterile water solution. You just mix the two together. And you would, you would use use a needle and you withdraw the water from the syringe and then you inject it into the powder that you receive, which is then somewhat fragile. Like you, you, you don't want to shake it up or let it roll around in your bag. You keep it in the refrigerator. But when you inject it, uh, this, this BPC stuff, what angiogenesis is, is that's the growth of new blood vessels, new vasculature to tissue. So it has like, like an anti-inflammatory effect, a pain relieving effect, and it would be something you'd use for chronic inflammation. Interesting. Uh, and it's an a, example, it's, is it local? Because you're saying inject into the it's, joint, it's, but then you're going It's local. When, when consumed systemically, it, it's, it's more of a, or when consumed orally, it's more of a systemic effect. Okay. When you inject uh, subcutaneously, some of it does wind up in your bloodstream. Okay. But m most of it, it's kind of like stem cells. When you inject stem cells, a little bit winds up in the rest of the area, but most of it winds up in the actual joint that you inject. Uh, one of the more well-researched areas for peptides is, for example, the elbow. Right? So mm -hmm. medial epicondylitis, like golfer's elbow or climber's mm -hmm. elbow or mm -hmm. lateral for tennis elbow. So you literally just pinch the skin away. Right inject. where the pain is or whatever. Right, as close to the pain as possible. Okay. And folks will do this like a two-week cycle. Um, an example dosage would be 250 micrograms a day for a two-week cycle. That's now, BPC. Now you've used that. I've, I've used that, yes. And what are the results and, like uh, for you at least? Re relief of pain and mitigate, in, in my opinion, bilateral mitigation of medial epicondylitis induced by pull-ups and typing. Um, another example would be TB500. Different peptides have different effects. Okay. They all have cute little Star Wars names. I like that. Uh, TB500, thymus and beta, okay. thymus and beta 500. So what this would induce is repair of actin and myosin. So it actually has more of a fiber effect than an angiogenic effect. So a lot of people will stack the two, right? You do a BPC injection and then a TB500 injection, or if you really want to just shortcut it, you can draw both into the same syringe and just inject them in, wow. in, into the same area. Wow. So you get that fiber effect and the angiogenic effect, which I've found to be super useful. So you've, you've also yeah. used the TB I've used the formula, TB as and well. And you also get a yes. great pain relieving effect Absolutely, from it. absolutely. So yeah. now, re, re, I wanna say as a caveat, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, they are not necessarily approved for human consumption. Not approved for human consumption. Um, they're, so they're sold right now as like, research yeah, chemicals. Yeah, TB500, you get it from veterinary websites. They use it in racehorses a lot, for example, like the tendons mm -hmm. and the legs of racehorses, which is why it works so well mm -hmm. in humans. Um, yeah, well, like compared, compared to like stem cells though, or, or PRP uh, or prolotherapy, considering you can do it yourself with a freaking insulin syringe, it's relatively painless at home. Um, is it expensive? It's, it's, 
It's not that expensive. Interesting. No, I don't. I don't remember exactly what it is, but I mean, it's it's not that expensive. Now, so the, the um, things that I wonder about with things like this is because they haven't been around very long. We don't necessarily know what the long term effects are. Now, I know I'm yep. being a little. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm, trying, I'm scaring yeah. people or whatever, but that's true with anything that's it's, been around. It's short true term. with anything, and of course, rodents have a have a shorter lifespan. And so, when you look at rodent models, even though all the research shows it to be safe, mm -hmm. which we can draw some corollary to humans from, there there have not, as you've just pointed out, been long term mm -hmm. research data in humans. I mean, it's been used in racehorses for decades. With no, like it's just oh, like, accepted in the veterinary industry that that's what you use. I had no idea. So um, now in the so context yeah. of, and these are all, this is all me speculating, but in the context of, because it does promote angiogenesis, it does, they do promote the growth of cells or the growth of tissue. You can ask um, me the cancer question. It's right. I'm yeah. wondering <laughs> if in the context right. of uh, a pro-cancer environment, right. somebody's poor health, high inflammation, you know, very inflamed, and may have some of these rogue, you know, mutating cells where the immune system tends to kill them, or at least they self-destruct yeah. themselves. Then you inject yourself with the stuff. Could that potentially? I mean, it's, I know I'm right. speculating. Right, but right, right. Uh, a, if that is the case for you, you've probably just identified the reason that your joints hurt. <laughs> so rather than <laughs> it's like it's like that's why your joints hurt. Cut out the inflammation. Get better sleep. Fix your life rather right. than taking peptides. Right. Good point. Um, and then uh, B. When it comes to uh, th this idea of a pro-growth effect, it's like the China study, which is a very flawed book. But the one takeaway from that study is that when you induce cancer and you put anabolic or angiogenic or high growth compounds into, let's say, a, a rodent model that already has cancer, already has a tumor, yes, it makes it then worse. It but it. in the absence of it, it's right. actually, it's healthy. Now, right? this, so, is, this is true with a very, uh, a potentially very high protein diet because a very high protein diet does stimulate uh, or, or increase the, you know, IGF-1, for example. Right. Um, if you already have cancer, if you Otherwise, already have cancer, it hasn't been shown to be an issue. Right. If you yeah. already have cancer, having more IGF-1 in your blood will make the cancer grow more. Right. If, for example, if you have prostate cancer, having higher testosterone may cause that prostate right. cancer to be more aggressive. So that's why I said in context of yeah. potentially having exactly. And you know, when it comes to the um, when it when it comes to the issue with with the anabolic effect of protein and the potential for cancer, I think that unless you already have cancer, the issue is more longevity issue, you know, an sure. increased rate of telomere shortening sure. than it is. So, so for me, I am not currently doing like the, you know, we were, before we were shooting this video, we were talking about the carnivore diet a little bit. Yes. Like I'm a little bit shy of that diet just because of the potential for uh, for for a higher rate of anabolism. It's like you have to strike that dose between health and longevity. That's right. If I were trying to get swole, I'd probably try it out. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, you know, I'm I'm like a big fat ribeye steak once a week, and I do some fish and eggs. And, yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it all depends on your situation. But ultimately, for me, the whole like anabolic effects, it, it's more striking a balance to avoid increased rate of telomere shortening than mm -hmm. it is to decrease risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way I look at it is um, there's definitely a trade off. But humans probably evolved going through periods of time where they consumed high amounts of meat when it was there, and then when it wasn't there, we just didn't eat a lot of it. And so it makes sense to kind of right. maybe cycle in and out of it. So have you experienced, uh, or excuse me, have you experimented with anything like that where you cycle in a period of time where you do consume a much different diet than other times and, and notice some of those effects? You or have know, you just learned your body by this point to know? I went I went raw vegan for a few months and just lost a bunch of weight, didn't feel that well at all. Um, and and I just you know and there, there's new research that sh that looks at everything from like the Prevotella bacterial ratio in your gut and your ability to be able to cope with high amounts of fiber. Mm -hmm. We know that people who uh, who um, have like a they're like heterozygous for or or, uh, or homozygous rather for the MTHFR gene, they might have issues with with excess folic acid. Mm -hmm. you know, there there's some populations that don't do well on a high amount of vegetables and some populations that do. Um, for me personally, I've kind of struck on the diet that works well for me. It's just a very basic omnivorous diet. Mm. You know, 50 to 60 percent fat, um, 20 to 30 percent protein, 10 to 30 percent carbohydrate mm. with the higher amount of the carbohydrate uh, on the more active days and also saved for the end of the day mm. so that I'm relatively ketogenic most of the day. Mm. Um, yeah, you, you really remind me a lot of the 
old school kind of scientists, when we go back to like the turn of the 20th century, scientists did a lot of experimenting on themselves. Mm -hmm. They would, you know, I know the, the, you know, vaccines, you know, they would test them on themselves before. Right, they, right. You yeah, know, vaccines, and, the guys who discovered what's, what's the gut issue. Ah, uh, I forget the story. H. pylori. Uh, yeah, the H. pylori Yeah, story. and how that creates yep. ulcers. He actually right. infected exactly. himself they with infected H. pylori. Exactly, infected himself with H. pylori to prove that, that it created ulcers. Yeah, and you yes. remind me of that in that sense in that you, and you're the perfect person for this because your diet is in check, you're active, you exercise, you get good sleep, so you've got the basics covered, so now you can experiment with all these different things and really see how your body's reacting. What is something now that you're, what is cutting edge for you now? What are some things that you're experimenting with now that um, are, are kind of new or have you tried everything on the horizon at this point? Uh, from a nutritional or from an exercise standpoint? Any of it, or any of it, yeah. Uh, like what's exciting you right now? Yes, so what's exciting me right now is uh, single set to failure isometric training. So not compound for, movement. For strength. Very basic where I'll Now this do, is the Arthur Jones approach, right? This is the uh, approach that, or, or at least that's what, that's what he think, did also. Wasn't he more super slow versus isometric? He did, so Arthur Jones, the inventor of Nautilus equipment did, and this is very famous, you can look this up, uh, the Colorado experiment. He did this with Casey Viator, was an old school bodybuilder. And they would use just primarily or all Nautilus equipment and he would do these single sets to failure per body part. And then he tracked how Casey Viator's progress mm -hmm. was. Obviously not a good study, it was one participant. That involved was, a, a concentric and an eccentric contraction though. Right? Everything, they, everything. They were moving, this, this, is like the, uh, this is like the Doug McGuff body by science type of approach. Okay. You know? Very, very slow. So you know, Doug McGuff works with a lot of senior citizens, gets them very fit. You create a huge increase in peripheral blood pressure, which is great for the heart. So it's okay. like cardio as strength. And you know, his approach, which is not the approach I, I was about to tell you about, but it's, it's like you know, uh, chest press, pull down, leg press, uh, shoulder press and uh, like a like a row, mm -hmm. right? And you'll just do about this fast. Max effort, or you're trying to just control Extremely it. slow and controlled, okay. like a 60 second up. So it's about time under tension. Got it. Isometric training is the maximum amount of force that you can produce for X period of time. So you would do, for example, anywhere from a 10 up to, in more advanced cases, a three minute set where it's just literally- You're so, just holding it. So yeah, um, so you'll grab like a lat pull down, just you go, you go to the area where you're most biomechanically advantageous and you just pull as hard as you can with no joint movement for- Oh, so you're not, so, yeah. I, so I, I understand so isolation. I'm sorry, iso you're doing isometric. I, isometric, so, oh, so okay. huge amounts of lactic acid, big dump in growth hormone afterwards. You feel how, like a beast How often you are you doing this? So once a week. So Saturday, once a week you get Saturdays, into Saturdays I do one single heart set to failure. And it's so just all tension, all isometric. All, all tension. What are you all getting isometric. out of that? Uh, so my heart rate variability drops for a good two to three days. Huge neuromuscular effect. Wow. In terms of, of the ability to super compensate and see mm -hmm. an increase in strength. Um, enormous volume of training in terms of specifically time under tension shoved into a very short period sure. of time. It's like a it's like a fifteen minute workout. Sure. Um, the unit that I'm using is called a Peak Fit Pro, and it is a force plate that has a, a signal generator generator in it that ties to your phone. So I can set my phone to beep when my strength drops off to sixty percent of what I was originally producing at the beginning of the set. So it goes hard, so I can last about 60 to 70 So you go seconds. as hard as you can, but then when it drops down to 60, so right. it's over? Yeah, the inventor of the machine told me you can go three minutes. Wow. And I, I've never seen anyone go three minutes on it, but you'd literally just be like pulling a deadlift for three minutes until you just Wow. Tips. And then that, so, I mean, a Any minute, carry over to other performance outside of that? Aside, aside from, you know, um, you know, joint strength and, and okay. force capacity, force strength, it's not functional, but it's a very good way to build strength quickly. Very um, cool. And uh, you know, I still pair that with you know running through the trees and climbing up ropes and doing all my Spartan training. I've been to your house. I know what your backyard yeah, looks like. <laughs> right, but but I use that. So that's so that's an interesting thing I've been experimenting with lately is, is isometric training to failure. Uh, the other thing would be um, hypoxic training paired with hyperoxic training. An example of a way that you could do this at home would be you would do like a um, uh, a series of ten sets on a bicycle where you're going for 15 seconds as hard as possible in a hypoxic state. So either freaking put a straw in your mouth or wear, say. wear like a training mask device and then pull it down once you're 15 seconds in and then continue to sprint 
for an additional 15 seconds with that surge of oxygen and you get a vasodilation, vasoconstriction effect where you're literally just pumping oxygen in the muscles at, at a much higher rate than you would under normal circumstances. The other way that you can do it would be, and this is what I use at home, is I have a, a generator called a Live O2 in my office with a bicycle next to it. And I'll do the 15 second sprint. This, this machine pulls all the air from the room into the machine, concentrates the oxygen, and it's got a little switch flip on it. You may have mm -hmm. seen this when we were at Paleo FX. Okay. Uh, I was working out on it. Okay, oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. So I you remember. switch it to hypoxia, you do 15 second sprint, then you switch to hyperoxia, you do another 15 seconds, so it's a total for a 30 second sprint, you recover on full oxygen. And from, and, and I, I haven't compared the effects uh, myself, but they say it's similar to spending like 24 hours in a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber in terms of like the induction of mitochondrial density, um, the awesome. delivery of oxygen to tissue. So, so um, two kind of like biohacky type workouts, but also very, you don't have to own like a $3,000 peak fit pro machine or one of these fancy live O2s. Like you could do isometric training I mean, you could push against a wall as hard as That's you can. Right. Like this is stuff you could do in an airport. Same thing with the hypoxic training. Right? You could you even could, use a bar could, with weight you that you can't hold, lift. You could hold your breath and run up a hill, and when you're halfway up the hill, start breathing. Right? Yeah. Like, like there's a lot of ways you can hack this without mm. expensive. Equipment, so <laughs> good luck if you yeah, try that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like my my buddy uh, uh, Joe Di Stefano does a lot of Spartan coaching. He'll just like go on a three mile run and put water in his mouth, like the Spartan kids used to have to do. And at the end of his run, you're breathing through his nose all the time. He's got to like you know, spit the spit the same amount of water out into a shot glass. You know, that that kind of like hypoxic training effect. Very is, cool. Is, it's not expensive. Very cool. Well, it's always awesome having you here at Mind Pump Media. Awesome. So I appreciate you talking with me and I appreciate you doing the experiments on yourself so that guys like us can look and see what works and what doesn't work. And watch me F myself up. And, <laughs> That's it, exactly. What not to do. Uh, yeah. Share this video with your friends, especially people who are interested in biohacking. Also, if you have a question, put it in the comments. Finally, subscribe to this channel. We post new videos all the time.